worship together. Our God. But our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms, kingdoms were strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. Jesus, you are, you are the only king forever, almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever, almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore. Victorious. Oh, our God is able, He's powerful, He's mighty, unmatched in all your wisdom. But unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice, you will reign. Every knee will bow. Worship you, Lord. Our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust in you. We trust the name of Jesus. You are, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Yes, you are. Because you reign. Oh, we, we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age, you, you reign. reign. Your kingdom has no We reign. lift our banner. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age, you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. the king of our hearts. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he's my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow.
when the night is holding on to me. God is holding on. You never leave us, Lord. You never forsake us. You walk with us every day. You're right by our side. We look to you, Jesus. You direct our steps. You lead us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. A Supreme Court uh, ruling out of Boston. Boston. Apparently there have been an explosion. You are our side of the marathon. Stepping out for the first time. The more it's a I'm saying to talk to Jesus. It's another thing when Jesus talks to you. Exactly. That's a mental illness, if I'm not correct. They mock Christians. Again, they live in a world where men can be women, women can be men, but if you're a conservative Christian, you have a mental illness. His family claims he was just out jogging, and they're now calling the killing a hate crime. Officials, should U.S. professionals such as yourself get involved? How worried should Americans be about coronavirus? Hello, everyone. Good morning. good morning, good morning, and welcome to those that are online. Thank you for joining us. It's a privilege to be able to minister God's Word, whether you're in house or in your home. We just know God's Word is powerful and it's working. I want to remind you of some biblical truths as we, before we take our text in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to make this declaration over you and your household. I want to make it over those who are watching online live right now as well of the, as those that will be watching this broadcast in the future. And that is that no weapon formed against you would prosper. And that you were abiding under the shadow of the Almighty and no plague can come near your dwelling. And that you're the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. And that God has got you covered, lying down and rising up. And whatever you put your hand to is going to prosper and is going to be blessed. That you're redeemed from the curse of the law. And through Jesus Christ, you are set free from the law of sin and death. And you now are governed by the law of the liberty that's in Christ Jesus. And don't let anyone steal your liberties or rob you of the joy of your salvation because God has come that we may have life and that we may have life more abundantly. And so thank God for his word. All right, I want to encourage everyone to find 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's been our text for these lessons. And it's going to continue to be so for the next couple weeks. I've come to the point in this series where I'm going to be talking about some current events that are going on in our country and are not exclusive to us, but are going on all around the world, and what the Bible has to say about them. I do want to say that since the, the onset of this series of messages that I have been taking time and uh, to prepare myself for this very moment, I still feel like uh, I'm going to be wading out into the water gently this morning, but I have been doing my due diligence, and I believe that it's time to open up scripture and to take a look and see what it has to say about current events and the times we're living in, in laying it on top of scripture. And so thank you for, you know, just staying with me as we go through not only today's message, but also next Sunday's message. I also want to thank Pastor Drew Wednesday night, did a fantastic job of bringing a message. And then if you haven't had a chance to listen to that, it is saved and preserved on our website as well as our other social walls. And you can find that message, very encouraging message about in this season, beware of offenses and how to overcome offenses and walk free from offenses. So a fantastic job. Also to let you know, uh, Joe Cunningham is going to be sharing this coming Wednesday. And so we're looking forward to Joe bringing a message to us. You know, we're in a season of transition here in the church, and we just are going to get ourselves back to grooming and developing and sharpening all the gifts and the callings that are in our midst. And so uh, I'm just grateful to be uh, surrounded by uh, people that God has graced and has called and has given uh, them the ability to bring a message to us from God's Word. All right, everybody ready? 
Everybody ready? Amen. All right. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says this, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, uh, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away, turn aside from them. You know, as, <clears throat> as we read our text this morning, I want to remind you in chapter 2 that the Apostle Paul has already given us some really good instructions in light of what he is going to talk about when it comes to perilous times. So here are some of the things that precede this text. He has encouraged us to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. He's admonished us to be disciplined like an athlete who is competing for a prize and to do so according to the rules and to be an athlete that brings honor to his sport. He's also encouraging us to work hard or to labor like a farmer in the field who will enjoy the fruit of his labor because that is one of the benefits is after you have worked hard, the fruit of your labor is sweet. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, as Christians, your life is likened to a soldier. Your life is likened to an athlete. Your life is likened to a farmer. That tells us that we have to be dedicated and committed and disciplined if we're going to grow and nurture and, and reach our maturity. And so I want to encourage you here this morning to take that to heart, to understand the disciplines that are necessary to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to set your hand to the plow and not turn back. You know, we used to say, just set your face like flint towards Jesus and don't let anything persuade you otherwise. And it's true that we are going to face many distractions and temptations in the world in which we live. But be of good cheer. God has overcome the world and the overcomer is living in you and through him you can overcome. He is going to teach you how to do these things. If you've struggled with discipline, if you've had a hard time being a finisher, if you've always bent and broke the rules and taken shortcuts, take heart. Jesus Christ can help you to stay the course by His Spirit, He can empower you to be what He has called you to be. And you don't have to go under, you can go over because of Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes all the difference in the world. So, I never thought I would see a day, and I never imagined or thought that I would live in a time where Christians forgot they were in a war. That's what I want to talk about this morning. You know, we forget sometimes because we get caught up just like everybody else in just the everyday ordinary affairs of life that we're in a real battle, a spiritual battle. And what makes this so forgettable is it's an unseen battle. It's not something we engage with in our senses, but it's something that we feel the resistance to in our heart. And we feel this animosity and this tension and we can sense anger and we can see prejudice and, and, you know, but it's something that's perceived in the inward man. It's something that's not going on outwardly as far as it's so easily identified, this war that we're in. Now, we see the results of all that's broken in the heart on the outside world. That's true. But when I wake up in the morning, I have to remember, not only do I have a great God in which I serve, I have an adversary called the devil who wants to go about like a roaring lion seeking someone who he may devour. And he's an opportunist. I don't want to give him a foothold because if I do, he gets a stronghold. And a stronghold is the way, a pe the way that people think. That's contrary to the way that God wants them to think. Through Scripture, we have the mind of Christ, but it only impacts and influences us to the degree that we allow ourselves to be renewed by this word. One of my concerns in the day in which we're living in, it only takes 21 days to shape human behavior. We have been in this pattern, this pandemic pattern, for well over 21 days. And many people, Christians included, do not understand the effect of what has happened to them emotionally and mentally and therefore are not addressing it with the Word of God. 
they have gone into a cave and they're secluding themselves. And I'm not here to progress to propagate that we're rule breakers or law breakers, but what I am saying is that we have to uphold the standard of God's word in our life and live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yes. And if we are going to be those people that are going to be a witness of God's glory and goodness, we have to saturate our mind and marinate our mind, as I talked about last week, with the word of God. And wherever people are, we respect that, we honor that, but we are always going to be encouraging people to press towards the mark of the upward call that's in Christ Jesus. That's our calling. So we're going to be pulling people up. We're going to be encouraging people to be all that God has called them to be. Can you say a hearty amen? Amen. amen. So the Apostle Paul admonishes us in chapter 2 also to present ourselves unto God to be diligent to study the Word of God and not to be ashamed that as we rightly divide the Word of Truth, we'll be able to share that truth with others. We'll be a fit vessel ready to be used by the Master. So, last week, we took a good look at verse 1, something God wants us to know. God wants us to have an understanding and be aware of the last days and we have discovered that we're in the last of the last days according to Scripture, and we'll prove that out even more here in a moment. And that perilous or dangerous, we could say intense or fierce times are going to be upon the earth. So in verses 2 through 5, he is going to begin to unfold some of the signposts that are indicators to the times in which we're living. Now, if just a few of these were present, we would have to come to the conclusion that we are not in the end of the end days. But when all of them are visible and recognizable, then we also have to say, wow, we've crossed over a line and we are now at the end of the end days. And with that, there is something that God has for us to do that he has not done. He is not done working in the world. He's not done working in you. He's not done working through you. And so let's take a few look. Let's take a look at some of the signposts that Scripture talks about. Now, I've categorized these into several different categories, and I'm going to go over them briefly, but I am going to land here in a moment on one in particular because it speaks specifically. You couldn't get any more specific than what it speaks of, of the days in which we live in and some of the current events that are going on right now in our nation. So let's begin by looking at some of these signposts on the road to the return of the Lord. And I think all of us understand what signposts are. I mean, they just tell us that we're going in the right direction or how far our destination is or eventually that we've arrived. And so here they are. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money. The word lovers of money could have been translated covetous people. People that just covet. All right. This is a group of people where self and the senses are determining their decision, not God's word or God's spirit. So in the last of the last days, people are going to be sensual, not spiritual. They're going to be driven by their senses and emotions and not by the Word of God. We could say they're going to be very subjective. Emotions are going to run hot. People are going to be given over to emotionalism. Emotions will be the determining factor for a lot of people's decision. In other words, however they feel, that becomes their faith not the Word of God. Instead of the Word of God being something they rely on, they rely on how they feel. Given over to emotions. These feelings are based on self-preservation. They feel threatened everywhere they go. They're defensive. They're guarded. Are we getting a good picture of what Scripture is pointing out and communicating to us? It uses two words, but in the Greek, it expounds to dozens of words because the Greek language is so much larger than our English language. So when it just says lovers of themselves and lovers of money, we could 
water that down and say, oh, come on, that's always been and always will be. Hold on, not as intense as it is right now. It's very intense. We liken the last of the last days last week to the fourth quarter in a football game. You're still playing football, but all of a sudden the stakes get a little bit higher. Everything gets ratcheted up a little bit more. The concentration level, the energy level, and also at the same time, the encouragement level that we have to give to one another gets even you know, more prevalent. The longer you're in something, the easier it is just to sort of go through the motions. But when you realize, hey, this is it, and we're not going to play any more after this, then I need to get with it. And the same thing is true with our lives. When we see the signs of the time and the signposts that lead to the return of the Lord, then we need to be active living for Him and demonstrating His goodness to this generation because there are multitudes and multitudes of people that are in the valley of decision and they don't know what in the world's going on. And those of us who have been illuminated and have insight into the signs of the times can simply point them to Scripture and in doing so, we can point them to the Savior that Scripture talks about so that they can be preserved and not perish but have eternal life. This is a time for us to really shine. Another category of people is boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. This is situational ethics will rule and the absolutes of God's Word will be mocked and laughed and scoffed upon in the end days. What are these people? Boasters, proud, blasphemers. They actually broadcast all of their sin. They're so proud of the way they live. They're so boastful. They're so arrogant. And in their pride, they're so blind and lost that they're willing to air their laundry in front of everyone with no shame, with no hesitation, trying to shame everyone who doesn't accept them, who doesn't tolerate them, who doesn't allow them to be what they think they should be and live the life that they want to live. So not only are people self-absorbed, they're so self-absorbed, they're proud of all of the things that they do and they broadcast it freely in front of everyone. We used to say they flaunt their sins. They just flaunt them out there. And that's going to be happening in the end of the end days. So they are proud, blasphemers, and disobedient to parents. They struggle with... a now, I, I, I would say all of us have been disobedient to our parents. But these people are blatantly disrespectful in regard to their parents. They actually disown their parents and want no association with their parents at all. They sever the tie and they walk their own road and say, I don't need you, I don't want you, and therefore, I exclude you from my life. You don't talk to me anymore. They usurp authority and they go out from underneath authority and therefore, they are in trouble when it comes to exercising or having a promotable life. And that's a very tragic thing. And that's heartbreaking for parents. But we're seeing the breakdown of the family and I want to remind you that the devil hates the family. He doesn't dislike the family. He hates the family. He hates the family. He hates structure. He hates order. He loves chaos. So he doesn't like government. He doesn't like authority. Well, let's take it even up and ratchet it up another level. He hates authority. Despises authority. He's anti-authority. And the devil hates the church. And so I never thought I would see a day where people forgot those things. And now we become so wise in our own eyes and so proud of the knowledge. Well, we, we, we sort of put a little salve on the wound by just saying, well, everybody's dysfunctional. And I don't disagree with that. But is that a reason not learn to learn how to function and learn how to go to God and allow Him to fix our dysfunctionalness? Yes, all of us have got spots, wrinkles, and blemishes. I'm not minimizing that. 
But people are unwilling to address that and to realize that they're in a spiritual battle. And so they just accept everything for the way that it is. Well, I guess, you know, there's no reason to fight for my kids. There's no reason to fight and to, and to honor and to be subjective to authority. I have my rights and I have my privileges, don't I? And I can exercise them. There's no reason to fight the good fight of faith and to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ and to uphold the standards and to be a part of the pillar of truth, which is the church. If I want to, I will. If I don't want to, I won't. And just very, very undisciplined. And the next category is unthankful and holy. This is where consumerism will be greater than godly contentment in the last days. It's been said that people have uh, purchased more items, were more indebted than any other generation. People uh, wonder about the indebtedness of our nation, and it's, it's really deep. We're in a deep hole there. You know we owe ourselves more money than any nation owes us. We're more indebted to ourselves. We keep printing money as if we're going to someday recover some of the losses that we have created ourselves. We've created this, this, this situation in which we're living. You know, in the 1970s, there was no national debt. Fifty years later, here we are. I mean, trillions of dollars indebted. Why? Because consumerism, consumerism is up. And you know what else is up? Unsatisfied lives. Because stuff cannot satisfy us. And so you can have the world by the tail, but if you don't preserve or have peace in your own soul, you have nothing. What do you gain if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? You have nothing. And so everything that we have that's in our hand, God wants to make sure it doesn't get in our heart. Whatever you have that's in your hand, you can hand it off to somebody else. But if it gets in your heart, that's consumerism. And now you can't give it away because it's mine. It's my stuff. And what? You covet and you want, and yet you're never satisfied. Scripture talks about that narrative. That's the end of the end days. People's hearts will be that way. They're going to be unloving, that means without affection, unforgiving or truce breakers, slanders, that means false accusers, and without self-control. This is the breakdown in the Greek language. The word picture here is the family. The family will be under great pressure and great attack. All right, brutal, fierce, despisers of good, traitors. This is mass confusion to what is right and wrong, good or evil, light and darkness. People will be reversing those, saying that evil is good, etc. And that's going to be going on in the last of the last days. But here's the one I want to land on just for a minute. Heady, haughty, high-minded. This is widespread violence. The Greek words that describe heady, haughty, or high-minded are some of the most volatile words in the Greek language. And this is what it looks like. It's when people address their problems or pressures of life with acts of violence. I don't know if any of you watched the news last night to see what was going on in Atlanta. And the turbulent time that's going on in that city or just to our neighboring state up in Minneapolis, St. Paul and the tension that's in that community or many other of our metropolitan areas in our nation. Right now, what's going on in them is evidence that we are in the last of the last days. That things have increased and they're more intense than ever before. God knew this, and God foretold this, not so that we would run and hide, but we would know the times that we're living in, and so we would know what to do. Widespread violence. This is another word picture that the Greek language communicates to us. Reckless behavior that is driven by hot-headed emotions and intemperance fueled by high-minded conceitedness. We see a lot of that that's going on in the day in which we live. And I'm going to address both sides of the coin. So 
Just stay with me here for a minute. And then the last category is lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is where self-pleasure will trump pleasing God. And not just by a small margin. In the Greek, it's a huge margin. God will be not on the back burner. He won't even be on the stove in some people's life. He won't even be warm. He will be off to the side and no one even give him any regards because of their seeking pleasure. The word love there means deep affection. It is the picture of someone kissing a mirror as in loving themselves more than anything else. That's a little weird, isn't it? We all did weird things as teenagers, but we should grow up out of that. But in the last of the last days, instead of people growing and maturing and developing, they're actually going to revert to more bizarre, strange, weird, volatile, emotional, and erratic behavior than we've ever seen before. We would say it's not rational. It's illogical. It makes no sense. I'm going to step on a few toes. Is that okay this morning? It's amazing to me the amount of people that will go out into many facets of society and when you see them, they'll say how much they miss and long for the day that the church doors are open again and the church doors open and they continue to do all the other things that they do. But for some reason, now there's multitudes of other excuses that they can find for not being here. And I'm not talking about those that are compromised with their health we preserve and protect and have ca compassion on them. I'm just talking about for people that suddenly it's easier to stay home and have the service come to them. What's going on there? Their mind is being effective and it's easier to serve self and to stay home rather than to get up and to come to service. And that's something we have to protect ourselves from. Even Pastor Drew and I were talking and he was saying, you know, when we first started coming back last Sunday, he shared with his family, hey, we have to be at the church at 840. And he thought, 840, wow, man, that's early. And then he just caught himself. See, we have to catch ourselves. He caught himself and said, hold on, I used to be there at 740. <coughs> See, and it's so easy. What is going on? That slippery slope that is going on in the world, and pretty soon the things that we say we value but all of a sudden, we can value something else, like our comfort creatures and our conveniences and having church in our pajamas. Now, if you're one of those that are in the compromised category, stay home, right? But if not, get out of the cave and let's live our lives. All right, enough toe stomping here. Let's get back and let's take a look at some further instruction that we receive from the Word of God. So in light of all of that, how should we live? In verse 14 of the same chapter, the Apostle Paul says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So when I look at the changes that I see in the country that I love and the church that I love even more, I have to pinch myself to see if it's a dream gone bad. Sadly, what I see is way too real and reminds me that we have an enemy, a real enemy. Satan and his demon spirits are arrayed against humanity. They have an agenda to steal, kill, and destroy. But our Savior also has a mission that we may have life and we may have it more abundantly. So you have these two contrasting forces that are opposed to one another that are clashing right now in the heavens and it's manifesting here in the earth. All the activity that you see going on in the world today is evidence that there was a battle and there is a battle going on in the heavens right now. What's happening in the spirit world is simply manifesting in the physical world in which we live. The behavior of men, the actions of men, the attitudes of men, I would say both negatively as well as positively, are a reflection of who they're aligned to, who they're serving, who they're submitted to, and who they're listening to. 
for those who are listening to their Lord and Savior, they are being a good soldier. They're showing up. They're doing their due diligence. They're getting themselves in shape spiritually like an athlete would. They're not allowing themselves to get soft and flabby. They're also very aware that they have to get out and sow seed. And they have to turn the soil and plow and they have to continue to do the work like a farmer does the work if they're going to enjoy the fruit. There's a lot of people in the day that we live in that want the victory without a fight, that want the gold medal without the discipline, you know, that want the fruit of the field without the labor. And that isn't going to happen. That's not the way life is. But in the end times, that's the mindset of people. I want something for nothing. Does that sound like some of the politicians' planks that they're putting in the platform? If we're elected, you don't have to do anything. We're going to do everything for you. What does that appeal to? The lowest part of our nature, our flesh. It just appeals to our flesh. You don't have to do anything, and yet you'll get all of the benefits. Let somebody else do all of the hard work. Have all the discipline. We'll just be like a Robin Hood kind of government. We're going to rob from the rich to pay for the poor. And listen, the rich should take care of the poor, and one of the ways they take care of them is to give them a hand up, not just a hand out, and they teach them how to work. They teach them how to be disciplined. They teach them how to live their life so that they're a good soldier and they quit running from responsibility and running from their family and dissing the government and dissing everybody else. Now, I'm going to get on the other side of the coin here in a minute, but it's important that I lay this foundation so that we understand that the days that we live in are the days that the Bible have foretold for thousands of years. We're not just seeing some of these signposts, we're seeing all of them. Every single one of them is now in manifestation in the world in which we live in. 25 years ago, I would say half of them were present. No longer. All of them are here. Some of them are still very young. They're not a seedling. They've begun to grow and they've begun, you know, to sprout. But some of them are in great fruition and they are just bearing fruit everywhere. So what do we do? Well, Scripture says we must continue in the things that we have been assured of. Knowing the Holy Scripture and that Scripture is able to preserve and to protect us from all the deception and all of the things that are going on in the world in which we live. So can we recover what has been stolen by the enemy and see God's redemptive hand once, upon, once again upon our land? And the answer to that is yes. And here we go. There's a coming restoration that Scripture speaks about that will occur simultaneously to these days that Paul spoke about in 2 Timothy. And let me give you, in Acts chapter 2, what's going to be going on in the last days that will be encouraging and edifying and inspiring. And it says, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see Visions, your old men will dream dreams, and on my men servants and maid servants I will pour out of my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And I'll show wonders in the heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when the enemy is at work, in the world, God is at work in the church, pouring out of His Spirit. He's also at work through the church into the world so that people would not perish, but they would come to a knowledge of the truth and that when they call upon the name of the Lord, they can experience the great salvation that God has provided for them because God does not want anyone to perish. And yet people are perishing all around us and there's peril and perilous things going on all around us. So it's time that we have a fresh touch from the Spirit of God. That we hunger and thirst for righteousness. That we desire to be filled with His fullness. 
Scripture says to be full of the Spirit and maintain a Spirit-filled life. That's how you combat these temptations. That's how you overcome these weaknesses of the flesh and these iniquities that are going to be prevalent in the, in the world. That's how you stay on the path of Christ is that you're full and you're saturated with the Spirit. How? Singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Singing and in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, speaking the Word of God, spending time in the presence of God. These are disciplines that allow us to be a good soldier, to be a fit athlete, to be a good farmer, to be approved by God as good workers. There's a scene in a movie, and I can't recall the movie right now, where there's an older gentleman who is teaching a young man how to work, and so he has got an apprentice, we would say. The older worker has an apprentice, and the first thing that he does is he sticks his hand out to shake this young man's hand, and when he shakes his hand, his, the young man's hand is soft and has no calluses. And the older gentleman looks at the young man and he says, we'll change that. And that's something that we need to realize is that there is a group of people that are in the earth right now and they just don't know any better. And some of us whose hands are calloused and who have had their hand to the plow long enough need to come along and not condemn them and not belittle them, but reach out our hand and say, hey, that can change. You don't have to just, you know, go through life ignorant and unaware and unenlightened and completely given over to emotionalism and live a subjective life. You can have a life of substance. Let me introduce you to that life. Let me introduce you to the person that can give you that life. All right. So days of restoration are upon the earth. All right. I want to turn your attention if you would, to uh, Genesis chapter 4. And I'm going to close with this because I'm going to pick up here next Sunday. Genesis chapter 4. And you might be asking, all right, Pastor, in light of some of the social injustices that are going on and some of the protest as well as the looting and the rioting, which we all understand are two different subject matters and two different groups, okay? So we have that firmly understood. What does Scripture have to say about this? I want to say that it is woven all through the tapestry of Scripture. Whenever sin entered into the world, problems came. And one of the problems was prejudice, racism, bigotry. And we're going to take a look at an account in Genesis chapter 4 that gives us an idea that this is not just a 21st century problem or 20th century problem or 16th century problem. This is a problem that has plagued mankind ever since Satan has become the god of this world system. And if we forget that we're in a spiritual battle, we go about trying to fix spiritual matters with carnal weapons, and we can't do it because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What's wrong with people when they're behaving improperly is two things. They're thinking improperly and they're believing improperly. One is of the head, one is of the heart. And listen, only God can change their mind and change their heart. I can't legislate love into somebody's life. Only the Holy Spirit can shed it abroad. And therefore, I'm in and you're in and the world's in a spiritual battle, and there's conflict, and there's host in the heavens right now. Satan and his demons are fighting, and God's angelic hosts led by Michael and Gabriel are fighting in the heavens. And there is a war that's going on over the soul of the people that are on this planet. And nation is rising up against nation, and kingdom is rising up against kingdom, and all of these things were foretold. And I want to take a look at some of the roots or the origins of this because unless we're willing to deal with the root system, we're not going to change the fruit system. Right. Right. So in Genesis chapter 4, 
This is the account of Cain and Abel, and they both brought offerings to the Lord. One was accepted, Abel's was accepted, but Cain's offering was not. And in verse 5 it says about the Lord, He did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So, all right, who is Cain taking his anger out on? It'll be twofold. First, he's angry at God. But his anger at God is soon going to be turned towards his anger towards his brother, which he had no reason to be angry with his brother. When people feel like they have an axe to grind with God, since they can't take it out on him personally, they take it out on people who are made in his image. That is the root of of all racism and prejudice, is that there is a sense that these things are not right and fair and just. And I understand, and listen, in some regard and in some ways, I 100% agree there are injustices and unrighteous things that are going on in the world. But how we handle those injustices and unrighteous things determines the outcome. And so here it is, is that now anger or emotionalism is now driving decisions. And it goes on and it says, so the Lord said to Cain, because he knew, he knew he was angry. He knew he was, that anger could lead to very, very poor decisions. And he said to him, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not you be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and it desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother. And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what is this you have done? The voice of your blo brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain was angry. But he wasn't willing to deal with his anger in a righteous way. We would say he was angry at Abel without a cause. There's no cause for him to be angry at Abel. I'm going to get real specific here. There's no reason for that officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota to take his anger out on George Floyd. George Floyd. He was angry. He took matters into his own hands. God... I imagine because God is fair and just, God probably dealt with that officer over and over again to try to get him to change his mind and change his heart. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. And because of that, what took place and what's taking place in our nation is an uprising of a group of people, the black American males that feel like they have been suppressed and oppressed. And I want to say a couple things on their behalf. This is not my words. These are the words of African American pastors and of black men that I've been talking to for the last three weeks. This is what they would like. Would someone please listen to my story? Would someone invite me to the table and allow them to collaborate? Would someone have empathy and compassion towards the plight of what we experience in being profiled consistently wherever we go? Would you give me your ear and not half an ear, but give me your whole ear? Would you empty yourself of all of your righteous answers long enough to listen to my anger and help me to get over it in a righteous way? Would you quit preaching me a message because I know the message, I just need someone to listen to me for a moment of time. I want to say this. 
This Bible is not written to white people. There's not a white version of this book and a black version of this book and a Latino version of this book or a Southeast Asian version of this book. This is the book. This is the standard. It tells the story accurately of the fall of man and what happened because of it. That anger is in the hearts of people and we can't get rid of that anger without God's love. And that anger causes us to do very harmful things. Jesus said, if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, you're a murderer. Cain and Abel and the story of Cain and Abel proves Jesus to be true. The longer I live, the more I realize everything in this book is right and righteous. And the more I'm conformed to it, the more that I am confused by what's going on with human behavior. And I wouldn't say confused as if I didn't know it was coming, but it's like heartbreaking type of stuff. So Cain's unwillingness to address his anger led him to murder his brother. Abel's blood spoke or testified against Cain. And the blood of many innocent people throughout history will speak against them on the day of judgment. God's desire is that what? We be our brother's keeper. That's God's desire, is that we be our brother's keeper. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord desires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Luke chapter 10, and we'll pick up there next week. Jesus answered the question clearly, Who is my neighbor? And we can do two things with people that we share this planet with. We can pass by and stick our nose up in the air as if we're better than them superior to them and that's a manifestation of pride or we can have compassion on them and we can help heal and their wounds with the civil unrest and with the racial tension and with the injustices that are you know being protested I stand arm in arm with my black brothers and my African-American brothers in Christ to say that we need to find solutions. And the solution is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that. And it's not for me. I'm going to close with this. So play, please, please stay with me for this next 30 seconds. For me, it's an understanding that what I have to be praying for is the right messenger. The message is the message. But the messenger makes a difference. In Scripture, we have wonderful illustrations of that. Paul, who is the most qualified to talk to the Jews, God sent him to the Gentiles. Makes no sense logically. The reason he, he did that was his Jewish people looked at him as a traitor. You betrayed your faith and your heritage. So his own people wouldn't receive him. Every time he went to them, they beat him up. On the other hand, Peter, who was the most qualified to go to the Gentiles, God sent him to the Jews. And the reason was, was because God was still working on getting the prejudice out of Peter towards the Gentiles. Because when he was with them, he behaved one way, but when his Jewish brother showed up, he behaved another way. And so the messenger matters. What matters right now for our nation is that God rise up and raise up messengers that have not only the experience, but the wisdom and the compassion to speak into our culture and to help Christ be glorified. And that's my prayer. Our response, I believe, is to pray, to listen to support, to be compassionate. Whatever sense of advocacy that you feel you can give that would be pleasing and honoring to the Lord, we should do that. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you that uh, 
We have heard a lot today. And all of it really matters. It matters to you. And Lord, therefore, it should matter to us. So I thank you that this word won't return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you sent. And I thank you that we're seeing very clearly that, Lord, the time we're living in is exactly what Scripture said it would be. Therefore, help us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And not to go about taking matters into our own hands, but, Lord, committing them into your hands and being peacemakers. We bless you and we thank you for that. And we love you because you first loved us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, those who are present. And for those of you who are watching online, thank you once again for watching. And perhaps you're watching and you've never made a commitment or a decision for Jesus Christ. And as I look around the congregation that's here, I know many of you have made that commitment to Jesus Christ. But in light of today's message, I also want to address you with some of concerns that Scripture talks about in the days in which we live. But for those of you who are watching, I want to also include you in this invitation. First, for those who don't know Christ, Scripture says if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The reason that we can call upon Him is because Jesus is alive. It's true that He hung on the cross and that He suffered for our sins, but the good news is the third day He was resurrected to new life. And all who call upon His name will experience that new life. And one day when you pass from this life, you'll be in His presence in heaven. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. I'm going to lead you in a confession of salvation and I want you to say this after me along with everybody else here in the auditorium. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe He's your only begotten Son. That He hung on the cross for my sin. But He was raised from the dead so I could have a new life. Jesus, I call upon you. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I submit myself to you. Thank you for saving me from my sin. Thank you for making all things new. Amen. If you just made that confession, contact us here at the church. Go to our website right now, lwfknoxville.com. Do it right now. Go to the About Us tab. Click it. Go down, fill out the contact information. We'll send you a Bible and some resources that will help you to get started in this new life in Christ. And welcome to the family of God. All right, for those of you that are here, as well as those that are watching online that are Christians, we have to get back to being Christ-like. We have to let compassion and love lead. These are very subjective times. We all have opinions. We all have emotions that are tied to those opinions without exception, myself included. I have to put those on the altar of God's Word, and I have to weigh them in light of my behavior. I have to be slow to speak. I have to be swift to hear, and therefore I can be slow to anger. I have to put a guard around my heart. You have to put a guard around your heart. Let me remind you, that all of us were foreigners, all of us were strangers, all of us were estranged from God. And He welcomed us into His family. He showed us tender mercies and kindness and compassion when we didn't deserve it. He sent His only begotten Son to save us when we were rebellious and insolent and unmannerly and unbecoming. The kindness that we have received and the mercy that has been bestowed upon us is what God is wanna, wanting us to reflect to this world. The best way to be heard is first to listen. It's a portion of Scripture in the Old Testament where before the prophet would speak to the people, he went and sat where the people sat 
and he listened to their stories. And upon listening to his story, he understood their peril and their problems, and therefore he was able to speak more wisely. I think it's time that we, especially in the white community, empty ourselves of all of our preconceived ideas, all of our stereotypes, all of our bigotry, all of our cultural differences, and look at people through the eyes of Christ. Where would we be without Jesus Christ? They're eternal beings like we're eternal beings. The only thing different is they have a different colored tint that they live in. There are cultural differences. There are heritage differences. But there's no differences in needs. All of us have the same needs without exception. So I want to encourage us because this is one audience I can speak to. Let's be Christ with skin on. Let's die to ourself. Let's take up our cross. Let's follow Christ. Let's be those people that he's called us to be. Amen? Father, I thank you. I thank you that you fill us afresh and anew with your spirit and that we would go forth to demonstrate your goodness to each and every people group. And we love you because you first loved us. Thank you. Thank you for your mercy and tender kindness. And heal our land. Grant unto our leaders wisdom. And Father, forgive us for taking matters into our own hands, for judging things prematurely, not being empathetic, not being understanding. And Lord, we go forward today with more insight according to your word in the days that we live in, in the way that we should live. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. In a world, in a world that's lost and seeking, you're the answer to every need I know. It's you alone I find a hope for all my life. I'm living as a sacrifice for you. In freedom and in truth. Well, Lord,
worship you, God. We worship you, Lord. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.